I'm joined today by Maria Eilith Wood. Um, Maria has been a coach for 30 years and um, an author. And after she wrote her first book, she came across the three principles. And she also now recently has um, got a publishing company. So my first question to you, Maria, um, what were you do how did you get into coaching in the first place? What was it that triggered you getting into the coaching world? Yeah, I mean, that's taking me right back, Anne-Marie, <laughs> over 30 years ago. So I was um, a manager in a bank um, and I think I'd been working at the bank for about five years. I was in my first kind of supervisory position. Manager's a bit grander word for it at that point, but um, I was sent on a week's coaching course to learn about coaching. And at the end of it, I thought, oh, great, I'm a coach now. And it really, the way that you were, you're taught to speak to people and listen to people and really help people to come up with their own answers just made sense to me, not necessarily as a coach, but as a leader. I was a leader um, in the bank and I worked for the bank for 22 years and I progressed up to quite a um, senior um, level. And I always used the coaching skills that I learned then. I mean, obviously over the years developed, a, there was a lot more training, a lot more learning, a lot more development that went into it um, to get to a point where, you know, I, I was really a coach. <laughs> it's like, I don't think I was really a coach after that week's, week's course, but, but what I loved about it, you know, when I think back now, I'm so pleased that I had the thought, I'm a coach now. Because without that thought, I probably wouldn't have gone on and worked with people in the way that I did. And over the years, it took me a long time. When I was first a manager, I, I was not the kind of manager you would have wanted to work for because I was a bit temperamental and a bit moody and a bit stroppy. And um, if you made a mistake, I would shout at you. And it took me quite a long time to become more the kind of leader that I really wanted to be, which was more understanding, really helping people to develop get better in the in their jobs and that was what I took so much pride in helping people to to do well themselves you know every time somebody in my team got promotion like I was so pleased and I know it was down to a lot of the work that I did in helping and encouraging them to 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 grow themselves so that kind of led me so I was a leader who used coaching for you know that the rest of the, the time and then there came a point when I decided that I wanted to go self-employed like it was a very very quick decision like I'd never I hadn't thought about wanting to be self-employed before that what happened was I would people would say to me oh you should be self-employed but I'm going mm, I don't think so you know I'm single I've got a mortgage to pay I've got nobody to fall back on you know da 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 and then one day, and it was March the 5th, because it was my dad's birthday, I had this thought, this, this woman was doing a presentation. She was um, paralyzed from the chest down. And she was talking about how she'd climbed a mountain in the Rockies by just literally, she had a, a, a like a harness built for her and she literally pulled herself up this mountain. And she said, on her first attempt she failed but then she had another go and the thing that made the difference was her mindset like nothing else would change it was just her mindset that it was different and in that moment I thought if she can do that I can do anything and in the same nanosecond like I was going self-employed and then that evening I sat down and I thought okay so what am I going to do <laughs> you know I don't know what I'll do and I thought about all the different things that you know I enjoyed dancing I enjoyed sports at the time um you know what can I do and I, and I thought actually the best bit of my job for the whole of the previous tw 20 odd years because by then I'd moved on to another company was helping people coaching people and I thought you know something that's what I'm that's what I'm going to do I'm going to do the best bit of my job all the time. <laughs> uh, 
And so did you literally leave your employment without anything to fall back on? Is that what happened or? Pretty much. I got a, a very small amount of savings. And at the time, because of the job, I was a director in a small business by then. Um, I say small business that had 120 people in it. So, um, And I had to give three months notice anyway. So one of the things that I did was I sat down and I worked out if I paired everything back and had the little bit of savings and the money that I earned for the next few months, how long could I live? And um, I worked out that if I gave, if I waited a month and gave three months notice, that would give me enough money to survive for nine months without um, if I got no income whatsoever. And what, what was really fascinating to me about that was that I then had to work out when I could give notice to my boss. And when, because I didn't see him on a regular basis, so we would only meet up periodically. And when I looked at the dates that we were due to meet up, we were due to meet up on the 23rd of April. And that was the anniversary of my dad's death. So the idea came to me on the and on his birthday, and I was handing in my notice on the anniversary of his death. And I really felt like that was him saying to me, "This is the right thing to do." So so that's what I did. So nothing else had changed. I still lived on my own. I still had my mortgage. I kind of looked at my expenses and, and pared them down a bit. I was prepared to kind of really kind of hunker down a bit. And um, yeah, about I think it was the 31st of July, I actually finished. So. And um, how did you go about getting clients? How did you find clients? Did people, was it people you knew already or? So, so what I did was I sat down and, and I made a, a list of, I tried to include absolutely everybody that I knew and I would put them into one of, I think I just had three columns. So one was potential customers, one was people who might be um, introduce people to me as customers and the other was suppliers. And then there must have been people who didn't go on any of the list, but I don't remember. I, I don't think I added them anywhere. And so what I did is I looked at the people that were my potential customers. And I thought, right, out of all of these people, who do I like the most? <laughs> and I went to those customers, those people, and I said, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I'd really like to come and talk to you to find out whether it's something that might be of interest, not, not necessarily to you, but do you think people in businesses would be interested in what um, I'm talking about, what I'm offering? And so um, I went to, I remember going to one particular company, uh, one particular guy, and I sat down and we would be talking, we'd have coffee, and I'd got my market research questions, all these questions, and I was making a note of them. And at the, at, more or less at the end of the meeting, he said, Maria, he says, let me be your first customer. He says, we want that in our business. And I ended up working with him and, and, and um, his um, management team. He was the MD of the business and, and his management team. And it was just a two day workshop, one day, one week, one day, the next week. And um, yeah, and that start that happened in November. So from or beginning of August, but when I started in August, like because I'd been working, my previous boss required me to work right up until the wire. And I had to do so much work in terms of a handover for somebody who we didn't know, like he, they didn't get a replacement for me. I was a director in the business. And so trying to make sure that everything was there ready for the person to come over, I had no time whatsoever to get ready for starting a business. So uh, when I first started, I had to do everything from scratch, get my business cards, my company name, my website, everything all starting from scratch. So I was really pleased to get some work in the November. And it sounds like you did it all yourself, yes? Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember at the time as well, um, it was the 2009, so it was um, the recession, recession was uh, starting to happen then. And everybody was saying to me, 
you, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I've given up a really good job, you know, really well paid good job um, to start a business in the middle of a recession. But and people would say things to me like, oh, you're really brave doing this. You must have a lot of courage doing this. But it never felt brave or courageous. It just felt like this is what I'm going to do. Um, and and that's, that's really interesting to me with what I know now, because I didn't know anything about the principles then. Um, this is just like when I look back now, I see how life was guiding me in a way that I never imagined. And, and I mean, I have had times over my um, whole career where I thought I was making it all happen. You know, when I was when I was first at the bank that I worked at, I'd got a 10 year plan as to where I was going to be. You know, I was going to be here by then and here by then and here by then and here by then. And I pretty much did go and and get every single promotion that I kind of mapped out for myself. But I also see that in doing that, I'd almost like closed my vision down in terms of of what's possible. Um, but I used to think that, you know, if you didn't have that kind of a bit ambition, you couldn't make it happen. And there was a, a woman, a friend of mine who was at the same level as me in, in the organization at the time when we were both quite senior managers. And I remember having a conversation with her about her career path. And she said, oh, no, I never, never really thought about it. And, and I kind of couldn't get my head around it. I, I dismissed it because I was thinking, well, you know, in my mind, you had to map your career out and plan it all in order to make it happen. And and I don't know what it was. It was like there was something I remember having that conversation with her. It's funny, but and it, it never went any further because it just did not compute with me. I, I how how can you not plan your career? And in my mind, I was thinking she must have planned it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you know she must have done something to make it happen because you don't you know you know you don't get a good career without making something happen but now I see how you know things have happened in my life that I certainly didn't make happen but I couldn't and I couldn't have even imagined it like starting the publishing company was not on my agenda it really wasn't and even when the idea was muted I was like there was a part of me that was when, you know, that when that knowing when I first went self-employed, it was a bit like that. This is really fascinating, actually. I haven't thought about it this way. There was a bit of that knowing. But also there was all this going on about why would I start a publishing company? I don't know really anything about publishing. Um, so but it's fascinating how because I'm so trusting of that. And when I look back, I realize I have been trusting of that. Um, life has brought me in a completely different direction to, to what it was before. And sometimes I still try and control it and still try and make things happen. But then when I remember, I go, oh yeah, no, it's not me that's doing it. But, but, but what I'm doing is following what life is offering me. So tell me how about your inspiration for writing your first book? How did that come about? So when I first went self-employed, I knew that I would wanted to write a book, but I had no clue what it was going to be about. So on my business cards, I had the company name was I Live Coaching at the time. And um, I put coach, executive coach, facilitator, speaker, and sometime author. But I didn't know what I was going to write about. And so for the first few months of starting the business, I thought, you know what, I'll keep a diary of the business because maybe the book will be about starting a new business. At some point, I'll be able to reflect back and say, this is all the things that I learned. This is everything that I did. And maybe that would. But I found that pretty boring. And so I did it. I did it quite diligently for quite a long time. And then there was a point where I thought, no. So I can't remember where the gap was between that and 
then one day I was driving in the car and I wasn't really paying attention to what was on the radio. Um, and I heard the word invisible. I don't know any anything else that was said. I just heard the word invisible. And I went, hmm, invisible coach, that's interesting. So at that point, I'd already started pretty much writing on a daily basis. And most of the writing that I was doing was reflective writing about my coaching. So what I was doing, I would, I would have a coaching client and then I would write a written reflection about how the coaching went, what I did, what I did differently, all that kind of thing. And so when that word invisible and the idea of invisible coach had just popped into my head, I started then doing my reflections, thinking it in the context of invisible an invisible coach and as I was doing that I was like just keep writing just keep writing and then something just started to emerge I was thinking maybe I've got a book here relating to invisible coach and so somehow from there I was looking at how I was invisible in my coaching how I was visible so the two opposites and then the variations, like, you know, how I was partly visible and how I was more visible and then how I was completely visible in the in the coaching and ended up with a with this model that I created. And then from there, like so this would be so I had the idea in the November by Christmas, say I kind of knew what the book was about. And then in January, this is a long answer, sorry. <laughs> In January, I, I um, signed up for a, um, an author event with Kogan Page. Now, Kogan Page was the publisher that I'd researched and realised Kogan Page publishes books about coaching. They publish books about business. So I really want Kogan Page to publish my book. So I went to this event. The commissioning editor was there. I went up and spoke to her in the break and I said, I've got a book idea. You know, probably millions of people do that to her. And she said, go onto the website. There's a proposal that you have to fill in. So I wrote this proposal, which turned out to be nine A4 pages long, submitted it and got a book deal. Now, I didn't know then that that was pretty unheard of to get a book deal from the first publisher that you've ever, ever been to um so anyway when she came back she said okay you know we're really interested in the book we really like the idea of, of the book I've done a complete outline of it and um she said when do you think you could write it by so this is mid-January I said well maybe I'll be done by the summer I don't know you know so they sent me the contract with a contract date of 2nd of July to get the manuscript in so I thought right I better get on with this then. So because I hadn't I hadn't written that much at all. I'd, I'd barely written a chapter. I'd got a few scribblings down, things that I thought might be in the book. And I thought, right, God, I need to I need to get on with this. Now, what's interesting to me as well, like at the time I had two significant clients. I had a number of other small clients, but two that were the bulk of the work that I was doing at the time whatever we want to call it, for some reason, those two clients closed down, not the business didn't close down, the work came to a halt. And so I had a good amount of time to then be getting on with the, with the book. And so I wrote it in six months. I mean, as I was getting closer to the, to the end date, I wrote and edited it in six months. So I was getting closer and closer to the, cutoff date and about three weeks before I realized the way that my process was working I'm, I wasn't going to meet the deadline I thought I'm, I'm going to need at least another two weeks to be to be able to finish it all off so I contacted them and said I'm really sorry but can I have a two-week deadline a two-week extension to the deadline and they said well to be honest we're really surprised you're that close <laughs> But I'd been working, honestly, I'd been writing on it 14 hour days, probably four or five days a week for 
for at least the last six weeks. It kind of built up and built up over time because I was thinking I've got to I've got to write this by the 2nd of July. And so then so I got the two week extension, so submitted the manuscript um, they looked through it. They gave me a, a little bit of editing feedback. We got the editing feedback, put all that into place. And then it was published the following March. That was from July to March. So, and the weekend after we went to see Dickon for the first time, like I knew nothing about the principles. Ash had seen, he'd been, because basically he was a widow for the, for the at least six weeks. Like he couldn't, get a word in edgeways really to for the you know my writing was going on so much and um he'd said he kept he kept saying to me you got to read this you got to read this I was going no no you know later later and so we went to see Dickon um and on the way I said to Ash this better not undermine my book because <laughs> by then he started telling me a little bit about it and um yeah, it was interesting. But what's interesting to me is when you think about the underpinning principles, they were in that book. And, and I'm not saying that I knew how it worked then, but I knew how it worked then. But it wasn't a conscious knowing. And, and coming across the principles really made me realise, like, we know this. Like, there isn't a human being in the world who doesn't know it that's why we can we can tell people about principles and you know who have never heard them before and they go yeah that makes sense because they're remembering it not and my book gave me a way of seeing how I could see it without knowing that I could see it which I just find fascinating <laughs> so once you came across the three principles did anything change or do you think you were living with the three principles beforehand anyway and you just didn't know you were oh no my life changed <laughs> um gradually i didn't have a well no i lie so on that on that program with dickon there was a moment when i felt a, a significant shift within me so the way that I describe it, it's like, you know, those those locks that turn you, you with the number locks, you turn it this way, you turn it that way, and then it clunks into place. That was how it felt in my chest. I felt like something turned and just clicked into place. But I didn't know the significance of it. Like it was kind of it felt like, yeah, yeah, you know, I had this insight and yeah, it was really nice. And but I, you know, I, now it's like, so give me the next one, you know, give me the next one, give me the next one. And it wasn't until quite a few years later when I was writing about that moment that I really realised how deep that, that insight was at, at that time. And so gradually, gradually, like my mind got quieter. So even though, like I was running a successful business, I'd written a book, um, I've got my own house, I've got a nice car, you know, all of that, that kind of stuff. But it was like, um, I'm, I'm reminded of, a, I, I did a, um, Andy Winter was talking at a conference and he talked about a student who was a straight A student who wanted to join the school that he ran um, because it was more like a 3P school. And but the school that he was running was for were, was for students who were um, um, what, what word would you I can't remember the word to describe them delinquent, like they'd be classed as delinquent in the school. So he was getting all of those kids in his school. And of course, this was a grade A student. And, and she said, but you don't know what's going on in my head. And so that was me like I'm a I'm a grade A student, but with a whole load of noise going on up here a whole load of thinking about you know if people like me I can't quite believe it like why would anybody like me and so like all of this noise was going on and I was doing all of this stuff in spite of all of the noise like in one of the interviews that I've done recently I realized that I was defiant even with the noise you know the voices in my head 
so what happened with understanding the principles is the noise in my head really started to quieten down and it gets loud again and then it quietens down and but I take all of this stuff that goes on in my head much less seriously so it doesn't I don't get it as much as I used to I get the odd moment and even when I do get it it's like well yeah I know that's what's happening I don't like it at the moment but I know it's going to pass soon and so understanding the principles just made everything a whole lot easier and the more that I've seen about the principles, especially over this last year since the pandemic hit and seeing how life has been pulling me along rather than me having to make everything happen. It's just made it so much easier for me to go, you know what, all I've got to do is follow where life takes me. And it just makes it so much easier. So yeah, the principles made a huge difference. But probably if anybody looked at me now, they wouldn't be able to see what the difference was. You know, I'm living in the same house. We've got a nice car. You know, I've got my own business. All of that stuff was true then. But, but so it, like on the outside, nothing, you know, everything looks the same. But on the inside of me, life is just completely different. And you mentioned earlier um, creating this publishing company. So how did that come about? I know you said you didn't have any inkling that you wanted to go into that business, but what was the seed that made mm. that happen? That's one of the things that I think is lovely because now that I know that I've started a publishing company, when I look back, I can see the seeds, you know, the breadcrumbs of uh, how it came about. But they are... The breadcrumbs that if I didn't know that I was starting a publishing company, I never would have taken any notice of. So that it goes it goes further back in terms of the way that I used to help people who worked for me now influences some of the way that I work with people, helping them with editing the book, writing the book, all that kind of thing. So I, I suppose that I... I met Jewel Swales, who is now my writing coach and mentor and friend on a program with Dickon. And we had a conversation one day over breakfast where we got talking about writing. Like she's a, a beautiful writer and writing. She wasn't a writing teacher at the time, but she um, did a lot of writing. And not too, I don't know what the time frame is, but not too long later, she said, you know, I'm going to start teaching this method writing. Are you interested? So I said, yeah, I'm interested. So two and a half years later, I'm still doing writing classes with them. And it's just been fabulous. So, so that was probably about two and a half years ago. So maybe about six months after we started the writing classes, maybe slightly longer, I can't remember exactly. Somebody said to me, Maria, would I've written this book. Would you have a look at it and give me your thoughts on the, the writing of it? The, you know, would you look at editing it? And I said, well, why do you want me to look at that? I don't, I don't know anything about editing. And this person said to me, no, but I really value your opinion. So I said, hmm, okay. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll give it a go. So I did that and I really enjoyed it. I was quite surprised at about how much I could see in that person's writing to help make the book um, um, a bit better. And then the pandemic hit and 96% of our work just disappeared in a puff of smoke. And I started writing The Daily Yarns which is this book. So, but I didn't know I was writing a book. So this was, I was writing on a daily basis, posting on social media in response to what was going on in the, in the world and exploring the emotions I was going through the same as everybody. Like I was going through a roller coaster of emotions from anger to frustration, to worry and anxiety, you know, the whole lot. And about, I'd written 48 of them like consecutive days and posted them and thought you know something I might have a book here so then I carried on writing I think I ended up with about 70 pieces and then I thought to myself you know something I'm gonna try and self-publish this so that was like the first 
foray into actually publishing it myself rather than um, going to a traditional publisher. And it was interesting because I'd already written another book that I thought I'd finished and I thought would be the next book that I would publish. But um, I put to one side. In fact, I've only really just in the last couple of months started working on that again. But this was fascinating. And so I made like a million mistakes in trying to publish this book. So what I did was I, I thought, you know something, I'm going to do a live stream just telling people about the mistakes that I've made. And from there, people started saying to me, um, can you help me with um, writing, you know, publishing or whatever. But there was a point, and I can't remember exactly, in, uh, the timeframes all get mixed up, don't they? But So I'm in my writing class with Jules this one particular day. And I don't know what we were talking about, but Jules said, and Maria is going to start her own publishing press. And I was like, what? You know, it's like, I've never said that to her. Um, you know, where on earth has she got that idea from? But there was a part of me that went, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And like, it didn't make any sense to me. Like, I, why would I do that when my entire experience of publishing is making a hundred mistakes trying to publish this and, and publishing with a traditional publisher? But it just made sense to do. And then I started researching all about publishing and, you know, the market and God knows what. I got, don't know how many webinars and things I've attended and reading and signing up to newsletters and book festivals and just all sorts of things, just because the publishing bit is learnable. That's the, the bit that, um, you know, just if you can't do it now, you can just go and find out how to do it. And like me, I have a go and I make a few mistakes and then I research it and find out what I should have done. And and um, so, yeah, so November, I was thinking, right, I might as well get this publishing company started then. <laughs> so... So was this a lot of work to get it started and up and running? It's really funny because I was just going to answer immediately and then I thought, you know, something, it's not it's not a simple answer this. I did a lot of work um, in terms of, but it didn't feel like work because I was really interested in it all, like learning so much. I mean, you've still got loads to learn, it's like there's, there's loads more yet, but, you know, watching the webinars, reading up on things, reading books about stuff, you know, all to do with writing and publishing. And there was times when it felt like work and most of the time it didn't feel like work. And the times when it felt like work was when I started to try to assume control again. And in those times I was starting to get really overwhelmed with it, thinking that I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do the other to make this business work. And then I go, oh no, life's got this. Then I, I don't need to work so hard. So kind of then come back to a different place and just keep on doing what makes sense to do, not 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 planning it, not working it out, you know. And, and I would do things like, you know, so in the work bit, it was like, OK, Maria, you need to put something on social media every day. You need to write an article at least once a week or once a fortnight. You need to do this. You need to do that. And then it was like, oh, you know something? I haven't got the time to be doing all of that stuff and then beating myself up for not doing it. Like, so I do all of that. I do all of that kind of stuff, but I do it when I feel like it, not when some, you know, a, a, a thing that I've written on an Excel, Excel spreadsheet tells me it's the date to do this. You know, I've got a spreadsheet all set up and book recommendations on a Friday and poetry on a Saturday and, you know, all of this stuff, which was just making it hard work for me. And now it's like, well, you know, I've, I've been doing the videos. I love doing the videos and um, you know, writing articles when I feel like it, or I've been 
sharing some of my writing when I feel like it and I've not shared it when I've not felt like it or I've been busy with other things and it's just yeah so it's not sometimes it feels like work when I get up here and then most of the time it doesn't feel like hard work and it's I can see it kind of evolving I can see the business evolving without me pushing it too hard I'm going to open it up to the others now. Do you have any questions or comments for Maria? Go on, Wendy. Me, 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 me. Oh, this is this is so good. This is this is juicy. Um, I love the fact, Maria, that um, you 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 you're a very confident, courageous woman. And it was that line you said. Um, why would I? Why would anybody like me? All that noise in your head, but you still continued, and I love that. Um, because I am um, I used to be a total non-believer in myself mm. and that's got a lot better now and to the point where uh, I guess free peace has had a lot to do with that but you know that there was still me before that achieving and doing because it all comes from us and um, in my job I've had in mind this this project I want to do and I think sometimes just having the thought in your mind, it just starts to happen, doesn't it? Because mm. that little thought kind of just d does stuff itself. But I, um, I just wanted to ask, so when you had that noise in your head, you know, why would anybody like me? And Because I struggle with that, like um, this, I see people in status and, and uh, although I'm still doing stuff and still achieving, um, you know, is there any sort of advice you'd, you'd give? Is it a case of just just keep doing it in, and maybe that noise will get less and less? Well, what I'm doing is kind of looking at myself when I had all of that thinking mm -hmm. and being a successful person in business and looking at myself now. And... What's interesting to me is when I look back, there was there was a part of me that had all the confidence already, but but I wasn't trusting of it and I didn't know I had it. But but I kind of kind of knew it's like, you know, when I talked about the ambition that I had and I had my 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 10 year map, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't do it. Like, and it's the same with the um with the Kogan page, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't get the book deal. And it never occurred to me that I wouldn't do the, do the book. It's like, there's a part of me that already knew it, but I just wasn't paying any attention to it. So, so in all of those moments, I was already okay, but I didn't think that I was. And, and I've even had it with, you know, I've got people who have been friends with me for 40 years and and I still would have thoughts of, yeah, but they're just being kind. You know, they're just nice people. So, you know, they feel sorry for me. So they've, you know, that so they're still being friends. And then um, it get it it every now and again it still gets me. Um and you can kind of feel it like um like a barb, like a barb in my chest. But it's like, um, whereas before it felt like that barb was there all the time because I wasn't paying attention to when the barb wasn't there. I was only noticing the times when it was there. And because I wasn't looking at the other times, the barb felt like it was there all the time. And now what I see is that the barb comes and goes and has always come, has always come and gone. Um, but it's where I, where I focus my attention to in my mind. And so when I had all the, the thinking about, you know, when, you, when I started the business, there was a point where, you know, something would happen in the work and it wasn't up to my, you know, bar that was set up here somewhere that I can't even, can't even reach. And then I would beat myself up because I'm not perfect. Um, like, somewhere along the lines with the principles I stopped paying so much attention to that 
And as I stopped paying so much attention to it, it became a, it happens far less often, and B, when it does, it's like, oh yeah, I've got that thinking going on. If I wait, it's going to pass. I don't have to, don't have to do anything with it anymore. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. That that thing where, oh, I'm having that thing, and you can notice it. Huh? It's just that, isn't it? And I, yeah, so yeah, yeah. That that's lovely. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else got anything for, for Maria? Yeah, just um, a reflection on what you just said there, Wendy. Also, it's, um, for me personally, it's learning not to be too hard on myself. Yeah, because I generally love myself now. You know, I'm a nice guy, <laughs> but I never used to. Um, yeah, lovely, lovely. Absolutely, really enjoyed it. See you then, Pete. <laughs> You're muted. You're on mute. I keep doing that, don't I? <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Uh, Rhea, I was just wondering, have you contemplated on writing a book purely on the principles? It hasn't occurred to me to do that yet. I'm not saying it won't. Part of me thinks, you know, why would I write a book about the principles? when we've got Sid's work, when we've got the likes of Dickens work, when we've got Elsie's work, um, you know, the Pranskys, uh, they've not done so much yet, but, um, you know, when Sid's work especially, like points to the principles so perfectly. But the book that, the book that I'm working on now that um, I thought I'd finished, but I'm not I'm working on it again, the thing about that book is that I think it shows the principles without necessarily talking about the principles. So I have a, a section in the book where I have written like just two pages that said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be mentioning the principles a number of times in this book. Um, and so just in, in case anybody wants to know what they are, here's what they are. Um, and it's literally that. And then if you want to find out anything more about them, go and read, you know, Sid's books or uh, Dickens book or. Um, and then all of the stories are stories that show how my life has changed from not knowing the principles to knowing the principles. And it's all different things. So it, and a lot of them like this is when I was very young, I could see this when I'm older how it plays out, same kind of scenario, but this is how it plays out now. And also it shows how insights were working, were happening for me right from an early age, even though I didn't know how wisdom was guiding me, even though I didn't know it was guiding me. So for example, one of the things is like when I was a kid, I used to, I used to be scared all the time. I thought I was scared all the time. Um, but what I used to do is I used to read a lot like I would be a voracious reader and and I used to see it like I would that was my escape I was escaping from life I was escaping from all the things the horrible things that I thought was going to happen to me and now what I see is I know that was wisdom bringing me back to my peace so whenever I was reading a book all of this noise that was in my head all of this fear that was in my head when I was a kid all of that would just go away and then I'd be in a completely peaceful place reading whatever book that I was and and by doing that I've been able to see all the way through my life even through a period of three and a half months when I was off work with anxiety and depression how that inner inner guide within me was was helping me and bring me along even though I didn't know anything about it I didn't understand what was happening I wasn't looking in that direction I was completely focused on the dark you know, the dark cloud, the horrible thinking. And then now I like it's I've just like seeing the principles is just gone, oh, don't focus there, focus here. And that's all it's done. It's like focus here. And I just keep remembering focus here. Does that answer the question? I can't even remember what it was now. <laughs> yeah, I love that actually. <laughs> Next question then when's the book out? <laughs> Um, okay, so you need to My ask pressure. life that one first. But as it looks at the moment, I'm hoping that it will be published this year. So I'm going to publish it through my press. Um, 
the editing work that I'm doing at the minute. So I think there's something like 58 chapters and I'm up to chapter 22. And I'm doing a couple of two, maybe three chapters a week with the editing. So that pu puts it at a few months before I've, I'll have gone through the editing. So it might be this year, it might be early next year, but I thought it was going to be last year. But in the meantime, these two books showed up. <laughs> so I'm not promising, but I am. It, it's interesting to me that for that, more or less for that 18 months, it didn't occur to me much to do with the work on that book. And then at the beginning of this year, it went, OK, Maria, get back onto this. And that's what I'm doing. Anything else from anybody? Any questions or comments? No. I think that was lovely, um, Maria. I'm, not, I'm never sure, sure whether to call you Maria or Ria. I know Jacqueline sometimes calls you Ria. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how that started. So, um, so for, for the longest time, I've been known as Maria. Okay. And my mum, if anybody tried to shorten my name, like if they went, to, if they called me Marie or or Ria, it was like, it's Maria. I've christened her Maria and that's it. So, but my dad and my nan used to call me Ria. They were the only two people who could get away with it. And so in the book that I've not published yet, because it's all these stories, in one of the stories is there's mention of my dad. And in this story, he calls me Ria. And Jules, who's been, who was giving me my editing feedback, she picked up on it. And she said, oh, she says, I like that. Would you mind if I called you Ria? And I was like, yes, because actually, in all honesty, I've always wanted to be called Ria. <laughs> OK, and I loved it that my dad did and my nan did. And of course, when they went, nobody else calls me Ria. And so Jewel started calling me Ria and she called it. She calls it to me in the writing classes. And then the people who are in the writing classes with me, they started calling me Ria. And it's like. Oh yeah, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> right, so too. call me Ria. Ria. All right, Ria. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time, Ria. That was lovely. There's a lot of um, juicy information in there, like Wendy said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ria. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank Thanks, Ria. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Anne Marie. That's all right. No problem at all. Lovely speaking to you. See you soon. Bye. Right. Bye.